Welcome back to the Deep Life Podcast. And today we are very excited for our guest, Erica, to dive deep on all things yoga, stress, and overall wellness. So welcome, Erica, to the Deep Life Podcast. Thank you so much for having me today. I think we met I'm saying met and in quotation marks on social media, maybe a year ago. I can't remember who started following who, but you also are your own podcaster. You have your own show called On and Off Your Mat, which I've listened to several episodes. And I don't know if that's what caught my attention on social media, but as soon as I listened to a couple that were in regards to wellness and spirituality, you talked a lot about chakras and our energy system and shadow work and diving really into that true authentic self that we're all seated with. I was like, this is my girl. I, I resonate so much <laughs> with it. I love it. I love it. So I, I can't wait to Thank have this you. conversation. <laughs> but if you don't mind, if you could give our listeners a little background on who Erica is and how you became mm-hmm. a yoga teacher and stress coach and what got you to this point in your life. Ah, yeah. So I am a yoga teacher. I'm a stress coach. I'm a podcaster. I think everything I do is to help women move from simply surviving to thriving. And so okay. everything kind of goes down into that funnel of they're all different tools to get to the same destination or be on the same journey, let's say. My background is I was a school teacher before being a yoga teacher. So being a teacher has always been kind of part of the way I do things. And you'll find that the podcast is very educational in that sense, you know, like it's always been in my mind to like help people figure things out on their own or give them the tools so they can figure it out and really teach embodiment, but also empowerment in that sense. The more you get to know yourself, the more you're equipped to do whatever you need to do. From there, like I found yoga through my own journey of struggles. Like a lot of people, I came to the mat, uh, suffering deeply. And I think all of that also informs why and what I teach today and why I want to help people the way I want to do it. From my own background of, you know, anxiety and depression, chronic illness, chronic pain, eating disorders, like all of these things who made me who I am today also inform what I think is important to help people kind of figure out in in their life because I've transitioned, I've learned over the years how to manage my health and my wellness and become pain-free after being diagnosed with, you know, an illness that they just gave me opiates and be like, have a good life. Like, here's your prescription forever, right? Like, Mm -hmm. so I figured that on my own. So there's tools there that then you can share. That's a lot of stress and nervous system that we might talk about a bit later are are part of and then just learning to move from you know being very depressive into like pretty much suicidal part in my life into like now living pretty much the life of my dream or like being on that path because that unfolds right like that's Mm -hmm. there's not like a precise point but like being so much more alive and happy than I was at a certain point all that transitioning in my own life is kind of the background if that makes sense the journey oh, to oh, where we I are got, today yeah I got I got chills from <laughs> from your stories about what you went through and, and where you are today and it's so beautiful and it's encouraging and it's what Dan and I are going through too I mean so much of your struggles resonate with with me I was never you know clinically diagnosed with anxiety mm-hmm. or depression but I I, I think I was, I struggled for an, with an eating disorder for nearly 12 years. And it's just, it's so rewarding. And I love meeting coaches. We love meeting mm-hmm. coaches like yourself because mm-hmm. we've been there and we've done, gosh, the nitty gritty. And if we can help people, even if it's just one person or a handful of people, isn't it? It's the most rewarding thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's also just working from that experience. And it's like, this worked for me try it and tell me how it goes. You know, it's yeah, not, pres- exactly. it's not prescribing anything to people. It's really like, this was my own experience. This is what I've tried and failed at and tried again. And instead of you trying to figure out on 10 years, like, what if I can like give it to you in this little, like beautiful bow thing and you can try it. And if it works amazing, if it doesn't, 
we'll find other resources that might serve you better. But like, it takes so much time to learn with trial and error. So like, if I can help you skip a few years of trial and error, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? Wouldn't be? Yeah, yeah save, save people from having to make the same mistakes that you did. Yeah. But I think it's, it's so empowering, I think, for people to see you as a coach who's already gone through these things and you've, act, you've actually done it and you're just like holding up a light. Like you, you found a path that got somewhere and you can just hold up that torch so people behind you can see it and follow and see if that path works for them. I think that's amazing. Uh, we want to talk a lot about stress and ways to deal with stress. But I think a great place to start would be if you could kind of make sure everybody's on the same page and explain to sort of the nervous system a little bit and so sort of what you know the parasympathetic versus sympathetic is, is. And I think the thing we need to know first about our nervous system is that is the surveiller of your body, right? So it detects the threats that might happen. They might not be real, but it's constantly looking for the possible threats around you. And it processes that information. And then it tells you what to do. Basically, it sends a signal for you to take action. So it's doing everything it needs to keep you safe and to conserve your energy so you stay safe and alive for as long as possible. Mm. So when you think about it this way, every reaction you have is in the goal of making you feel more safe in situations that you might not quite feel safe in that moment. It's annoying, but it doesn't matter if you're actually safe or not safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what matters? Not, not necessarily the best thing for you, but, it, but you'll feel safe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you might actually not be in danger also. Like you might be totally safe in that moment, but because of your perception of the situation, because of the way you interpret what's happening, because of what you perceive to be difficult, challenging, adverse, or plain dangerous, the story you tell yourself about it is going to make your system react, even if it's not in the fact actually happening. When we talk about sympathetic and parasympathetic branches, we're talking about the autonomic part of your nervous system. So that's the part that works automatically. So we don't have to think about it and we can't even really control it. And sometimes people are like, well, if it's on an automatic, why even do something about it if I can't control it? And the beauty is like, correct, you can't control it. Your response happens in milliseconds, like this whole and old system, but you can influence it. As soon as it happens, you're able to do something about it. And you can influence your general baseline. You can influence your own window of tolerance of like the place where you function optimally over time, right? You cannot influence like right the second, the safety response and the trigger that you experience but then you can influence so many other things that will affect your whole experience. So in that autonomic branch of your nervous system, we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic response and the most like basic way to explain it. Your sympathetic branches is your activate, mobilize, let's get rid of the threat situation, mm -hmm. right? So it's whatever you need to do to get rid of the threat. That usually look like fight or run away to save yourself. Right. So it's that energy. Your adrenaline is going to go up. Your cortisol is going to go up. Your muscle tension is going to go up. Your breath is going to get a little faster, a little shallower. Right. So all the things that you need to have to fight to save your life or to run really fast or faster than whatever's running after you. Right. So those are the body responses like, you know, blood pressure. There's all sorts of things, but like in a really simple way, that's what happens in your body. And at the same time, the system is going to take energy away from things that are not considered essential in that moment. Like if you're running for your life, you don't need to digest your lunch right now. It can wait till later, mm -hmm. right? Like it's not a priority. So thinking that it's trying to conserve your energy to keep you alive, is going to do things like slow down your digestion, it's going to do things like stop your reproductive hormones. You don't need to have libido right now. It's really not a priority for you to be able to connect emotionally and lovingly with another human being, right? Like, let's put that on the back burner. You need to run fast. So like all of these other things that are considered not essential for your survival are going to be kind of put down into the side that it's thyroid function. Like there's so many things that then, then like it just stops. Yeah. It's not a problem in the moment. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, it's it's, not a, no, no, you, <laughs> yeah, you finish, yeah. 
I think it's not a problem in the moment because if you're actually fighting for your life or running for your life, you don't need those things to happen. It becomes a problem when we're in a constant chronic state of stress where yes. all of a sudden we have digestive problems that are becoming chronic. We have you know, libido issues, fertility issues, all sorts of reproductive issues, thyroid issues, like all sorts of other, you know, the gamut of problems in your system because mm -hmm. you're always on one side of the activation. You're always on the sympathetic activation of your nervous system. Yeah? yeah. Did you want to say something before I go into parasympathetic? Yeah, no, I was, I was going to emphasize that same point. I think it's, it's, it's all the things that you mentioned are sort of major health epidemics in, in our modern society. And it's because it's like, we're not, we're not worried about sort of like that tiger stalking us in nature anymore, but it's the same response just all day long, all day, every day. Yeah. And then it becomes not useful anymore. Right. We right. get stuck. We right. get stuck. Like we're activated again and again and again, and we never get to go to the other side, which is the parasympathetic response. And we talked about the body, but there's also like the emotional side and the mental side of the sympathetic response. And we want to be able to oscillate from one to the other fairly easily and rapidly. And we want to kind of create it in the balance between how much time we spend into each branch according to what we're trying to do, like depending on how much we need to be mobilized versus how much we need to be, let's say, engaged socially or connected, right? Like what's happening in, the, in that case can be also be different. So if we look at the parasympathetic branch, it's a little bit more complicated to explain in the sense of like, it's been redivided. If we look at polyvagal theory and the work of Stephen Porter's PhD, it shows that it's not just parasympathetic, like in opposition to the sympathetic response, but that it redivides in your dorsal and ventral vagal. And that kind of includes vagus nerve talk and like a little bit more nerdiness into, you know, the nervous system, but like in a very general way for now, and we can dive in more if you'd like, but in the general way, it'll be the opposite of your sympathetic response. Right, so your breath's gonna slow down, your heart rate's gonna slow down, your libido's gonna rise up, your muscle tension is gonna reduce, your saliva is gonna, you know, every part of the digestion. So saliva is gonna be uh, augmented, enzymes, and then urine output is gonna be elevated. So all those things in your body are now gonna be able to happen in a more optimal way. Now, depending on where you are. If you're more ventral vagal or dorsal vagal, the emotions and thoughts are going to be different. But if we contrast the sympathetic and parasympathetic response in general, in sympathetic, when you're like in your fight or flight, it's a lot of worry, anxiety, fear, and that kind of thoughts, you know, fear-based thought, anxiety-based thought, the what ifs, the well, I'm not enough, this is not, this is too much, like anything that's very like black or white kind of thought where we go into the more relaxed state, it's more gray, we're more nuanced, we're more relaxed in our position, right? We're more also feeling kind of even in our emotions. It's not so intense. We're able to be like discerning, right? Like it's a very yeah. different energy, right? Mm -hmm. More present, more connected, more loving. So like if a problem arises and we're in a place of very parasympathetic, response, we're able to not necessarily get into like a, I'm going to fix this problem kind of mentality with the fight energy, but we might just be like coming from a more loving place, more compassionate place, more generous place, right? So it's a different way to approach the same situation, depending on, on where you start. Is that enough information for now? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. And I, I mean, it's a lot already. <laughs> No, we love it. And we want you to dissect these things because Dan and I know exactly what you're talking about and we resonate so much with it, but we want to make sure that the listeners obviously have very in-depth information on it and you are, you're describing it perfectly. And I think it's, it's great because we're at least just putting seeds in people's heads now, right? Because a lot of people don't realize that they're living this fight or flight mm -hmm. sympathetic nervous system. They really don't. I didn't realize I was living like it until we began to drastically change our mindset. So I'd love to dive deep kind of into taking a bit more handle on our mental wellness and just having ownership of it, being aware of it. And kind of, mm. if you could maybe give us some ideas on, you know, developing tools specifically for stress and how to minimize chronic stress, because I swear to God, I, 
I really don't. I maybe know like other than you and Dan and like maybe like three other people. I the majority of people I know are chronically stressed. And and, I, and I don't mean to see that like to be rude or anything. I just I they're just so used to it that they don't really they're like um what's the word I'm looking for? Just just like surviving uh, anxiety. Like they're just literally living Yes. moment to moment that, that becomes survival. their new normal yes new normal for them yeah it becomes your new normal and you start noticing it you start yeah. noticing it actually yes. 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 because it's like it's there all the time it's what i was talking about before your baseline changes your baseline becomes stress that's your normal baseline and so you don't feel like it's such a big deal right and i tell the story on my podcast i have this episode on stress and i tell the story that I was really ill and really sick. And I went to the doctor and he was like, how's your stress? I was like, eh, fine, like average, right? Like I didn't think back then that it was anything more than anybody. Like I was like, eh, I'm kind of stressed, but not really. But I didn't actually really know what stress really looked like, right? I didn't really know what it meant in my body, what it meant in my mind. Like, that everything I was doing day in, day out were actually signs of stress. Like I, w- I didn't have that awareness. So I think it's important that kind of we talked about, we talk about that, that idea of using that knowledge for agency and for being able to take action in our own life is so beautiful because we, in my experience, we have to stop relying on MDs to tell us what to do with our bodies. Like as if they have all the answers and they know our bodies better than us. And don't get me wrong, and these are amazing, and they're essential resource that we should use and, you know, um, take advantage of. But we know we have the potential to know so much about ourselves and yes. to understand how we work, to understand our thought patterns or emotional reactions. I mean, stress affects every aspect of your system. And the nervous system controls pretty much every system that includes, as I'm saying, your muscles your energy level, your emotions, your organs, your breath, your hormones, your glands, like it controls all of these things. So like, if you can go at the source and start to address your stress, it's going to like ripple into so many other things. So it's a really, obviously. (laughs) I love that. Absolutely. And we're, we're very much like in agreement with, yes, doctors are amazing. They save lives. There is a time and place for medical intervention. I could not agree more with you, but when we leave it up to people who don't really know anything about us and our bodies, other than maybe some notes that they've taken, but haven't lived in our human suits that we're living Mm -hmm. in right now, it can get very dicey. And yeah, of course they'll give you maybe some drugs or pills that may counteract what really is going on. So, so I, I love that. It's really taking ownership of, yeah. of our own health and well-being. And our, our bodies are highly, highly intuitive. Their natural state is well-being and health and bliss and love. Like that's what we're here to do. We, yeah. We're not we're not machines, you know, we're not made to, um, you know, just feel crappy all, all the time. And that's, that's really our body's response to being out of alignment or too much stress in our lives. Our bodies are huge indicators of what's going on mentally and internally. Yeah, absolutely. If you feel pain, that's a symptom of like the body is telling you that's the way it's communicated. If you're feeling yes. depressed, that's the way your body's communicating something to you. Like nothing is random. Nothing is just like, oh, my body is being annoying and just sending me this thing that, right? It's trying to tell you something with all the signals it sends you. You can't sleep, it's trying to talk to you. You can't eat, it's trying to talk to you. You're eating too much, it's trying to talk to you, right? It's like never ending kind of conversation back and forth. It's about understanding that language, basically. It might be inconvenient, but it's not mm-hmm. a mistake. It's get, like you said, trying to get your attention. And I think we run into that problem when you, experience a symptom and take a pill to numb that system, but don't actually, or that symptom, sorry, but you don't actually address the root cause, then you just aren't hearing your body screaming for help. So it's going to have to scream in another way. And I think it's just, it's just going to keep coming back to you address the root cause. Exactly. And I think when we look at our stress and our nervous system, we're going to root cause because stress yes. impacts 
basically every disease that we experience nowadays. Like, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at that, you have a pretty good start towards your health, your wellness and your health improving. So what, what are some tools people can use when they're experiencing so stress? I think the first step is understanding where you are. Like I mentioned with that quick story, you have to know what stress looks like in your body. You have to understand those messages. You have to practice the skills of observing, of watching yourself, of understanding your physical reaction. Like, you know, like, oh, I'm having kind of heart palpitation. My body's warm. My neck is tense. What does that mean? Right, mm. and being able to like put the puzzle pieces together and feeling the sensations in your body. And for a lot of people, that's like you need to take a step back to even just feel. We're so accustomed to numbing ourselves yes. that only feeling can already be a challenge. So mm. taking that step back, you need to feel and then learning like, okay, this means this for myself. Right. That also includes really thinking and observing your thought patterns and mm. what thought fuel, what emotion in your body, what emotion pushes you to take what action, what action usually gives you what result, like this kind of pattern that we have, becoming really aware of the ones we repeat a lot because chances are they're participating to your stress, mm. right? It's like you're experiencing a lot of emotion that are around fear, worry, anxiety, shame, doubt, judgment, criticism. Those are all like fueling your stress and I could keep going, right? But you yeah. can't. Yeah. <laughs> so like observing your emotional pattern, observing your thought pattern, that might mean depending on you and your personal preference, journaling, mindfulness practices, meditation, uh, just slowing down, like whatever yes. helps you feel, observe and name your experience over time within seconds. That would be the first step and the first like set of tools and skills I believe you need to, to learn to move along with your wellness in that sense. Yeah, and that's exactly kind of what we did. We developed like a yoga practice a couple years ago. Meditation has been a big, big part of our lives. It was challenging at first, especially for me because I had so many negative thoughts, but I realized mm -hmm. that I needed to release them. They were just, I, I, I was becoming a conscious observer. It took me a little while, but exactly what you're saying. And journaling, wow, I had no idea the profound effect journaling would have. The, the simplest questions, I would get them on the internet or off Pinterest, or like if someone reposted just anything, I would journal it. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't even keep up. My hand was writing so much. I had no idea I had all of these thoughts. And then I would almost reread what I was journaling. And that would bring up more emotions. I would either cry or be angry. And it was, it was, it was kind of like, where is this coming from? But then like 10 minutes later, it was the most profound release I've ever felt. And I, I can't, I can't, we cannot recommend journaling more to people. Mm -hmm. so and proud. for a long time, I had like this really difficult relationship to journaling. I didn't like it. And I told myself it was not not working. Yeah. And some of the things I've done is like, I think I felt like my mind was so fast that my hand couldn't follow. And then I would lose my train of thought kind of yes. you know, situation. So I've practiced leaving myself like a voice memo. Like I'm walking around the house in a circle and I'm just talking into my phone. And then you kind of, then you go sit in meditation. You kind of emptied your mind, right? You said all the things you needed to say. And then you can re-listen and then take a few notes of like, oh, look at that. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Silly brain, right? Like kind of go into more analysis or observe mode when you created a little bit of detachment from like the intensity of being into the, the reaction in the moment. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's just a little different, right? It's we're all, we're talking about the same thing, but it's a little bit unique for you. And that's what it is, you know, with everybody, it's going to, it's going to be different. I love that. So yeah. once you've worked on the skill of observing yourself, getting to know yourself, literally studying everything you do, the next step is meeting yourself with acceptance. And mm. that's a full skill that could be so hard. Self-love, self-compassion, giving yourself grace. Because if you're bullying yourself into making a change, it's not going to work. 
for two yeah. particular reasons, but one, as it relates to your nervous system, you're not making yourself feel safe. Like you're mm. putting yourself in a space of like, this is not okay. You are not okay. You need to be fixed because you're broken. Mm. And this energy, your system will do like, uh, uh, protect myself. This is not good energy coming mm. towards me. Right. So instead you have to learn to meet yourself where you are. You're like, okay, I'm feeling really agitated. Can I feel this agitation for a moment without letting yourself go into what it means about you as a person, a mother, a yogi, whatever the label you'd like to you know, put on yourself and just like, wow, I'm feeling so agitated. That's just one example, right? Meeting yourself there, giving yourself a moment to really be with it mm. and then matching that energy. Because if you're forcing yourself to go straight into, let's say, meditation, Let's say you're super agitated. Your thoughts are like ping ponging. Your body is like fidgeting. And then you're like, I'm going to go sit and meditate. What do you think it's going to feel like? You're not going to feel like all done and quiet all of a sudden, right? You're going to feel fidgeting. You're going to feel like everything in your body is uncomfortable. You're going to feel like your thoughts can stop swirling around or you're, rep you're like repeating like this obsessive kind of thought pattern or it's like going back and forth between all the things you've been thinking about. You need to take a step back and work with that agitated energy first. Yes. So that might look in many different ways. I like to shake. I like to dance. Dance is probably my favorite way. I put one crazy intense pop song and I just yes. dance it out. And then I can actually go and sit and quiet down and slow down and be more mindful, right? Like meeting yourself, giving yourself a matching vibration so it's can dissipate because if you go with something really opposite it creates friction it creates like this fighting energy and you're not giving yourself the space to be with the energy you're to be in the moment to be with what you're experiencing now so whether it's shaking dancing whether it's uh, you know running for some people a faster pace that like kind of yoga practice like something that's very dynamic there's many things you can do to meet your energy there. If you're feeling really angry, right? Maybe it's yelling, maybe it's hitting something, maybe it's depending on the emotion, the type of energy within that sympathetic response, then you do something to meet it there. That's the second, in a nutshell, that's the second skill. Then you can bring the opposite energy. And that would be kind of the third skill. Once you've met yourself with acceptance and compassion and you've matched, you know, you've brought a tool to match your energy then you can start to transitioning, to transition. Your body feels safe, right? And if you think that your nervous system is about safety, you need to give yourself this time to have this conversation of like, you can trust me, take my hand, let's go in this direction. Instead of yanking and be like, no, I said, quiet down now, <laughs> right? So it's a very different kind mm -hmm. of approach. And then that might look also many different way when depending on what you need. Do you need to sit quiet and meditate do you need to do something that's more like restorative yoga yin yoga or still dynamic but like super focused on your breath really slowing down the breath maybe adding like a humming a vibration like focusing on positions that are like inverted or that are cooling or right like there's so many tools that we know within yoga and other somatic practices that then can help us bring in more parasympathetic activation and bring us, you know, back towards a more relaxed state where we're more connected, we're able to engage, we're able to have that spaciousness in our, you know, responses and balance the state that we tend usually to go to instead. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that, so that was amazing. Yes. Thank you for breaking them down. It's, it's, it resonates so much and I can visualize them. And I do think it's going to be really helpful for, for people. It's, it's really about the awareness and I love how you broke it down. Yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of stuff in there that, um, there's a lot of stuff that's really, really useful, but people might be almost like questioning it a little bit, but I feel mm -hmm. like having, having gone through all those steps, like this stuff all does work. Yeah. And it is, I think it's a lot of stuff that people do intuitively to a small degree, but I think bringing awareness to it will just allow, allow that practice to grow and allow people to get a lot more control. Like you mentioned like humming and vibration and 
that might sound a little crazy to people. How like, how's that gonna help? Like everything's vibration. When you stub your toe, <laughs> what's your, your first reaction is to pull back, <laughs> like vibrating, making a tone and changing the vibration in your body so that that pain goes away. Mm -hmm. So it's like doing that, doing that, stuff like that on a bigger, bigger uh, scale and with more intention is gonna help, I think, help drastically. Making look so weird. People are like, oh yeah. 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 <laughs> But I think the doubt often comes from our need of instant gratification. It comes from, I want the magic pill to fix this. And none of what I've said is a magic pill. And I'm sorry if that's where you're looking for. It's not it. It's not the do this one thing, you know, one minute a day and you'll be fixed forever. This is a practice and it takes time. And I can't lie to you. It takes, it's a journey. Before you see real change, it might take a few months. You might have mm -hmm. to commit and be like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to show up. And it might take time because there's subtle things that are going to start to change. So if you're not fully aware of like what's happening and you're not observing, you're going to miss a lot of the signs that things are actually improving. So that awareness goes both ways. It's about knowing what you need so you can choose the right tool for you after. But it's also observing if it works or not on yourself so you can pivot as you need. But I think for people that are doubtful, it's just, you need to try it. You need yeah. to try it. Like I, I'm challenging you. If you're like humming is stupid, I'm challenging you <laughs> to sit for three minutes and hum every exhale. So dig in your inhale, mm, put a timer, do that for three minutes and see how you feel after. Mm -hmm. And if you feel nothing, okay, go look yeah. for other tools, you know, right. like, Sure. Maybe that's not, you're not, it's not the right time for you to do these practices. It's not the right practices for where you are in your nervous system state right now. There's other tools out there. But like, I think if we have doubt and we take the courage to be like, okay, I'm willing to try anyway. I'm open-minded enough to be like, she's kind of crazy, but <laughs> who knows? Yeah. I'm, you know, sometimes we have to be kind of desperate enough for these things or like at the rock bottom and be like, I'm willing to try anything. Yeah. Why not wait that you're not at the rock bottom and have that attitude of like, I'm willing to try anything. Yes. See what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And that's, like you said, it's just, you're not going to be transformed and stress-free within an hour. This isn't a magic pill. Same thing with the coaching that we do. You know, we, it's months that we have to coach people. It's not a year to get them where they want to be because everything takes time. And it's also, we're striving for longevity on this. The exactly. one thing, pill fix is going to end just as quickly as it began, right? So that's kind of our slogan. It's the building momentum. It's the, it's the one small little incremental things that you can do. And it's going to compound. It's going to get easier. It's going to get less silly. It's going to make you feel better and better and better. And I'm not saying that a practice that is two minutes long or three minutes long is not going to have an impact. It will. Oh, but yeah. it's not going to stay forever with right. you, right? You have to repeat. You have to create that repetition so your body moves slowly that baseline upward towards a more relaxed state having a practice kind of gives you gives you something not only to like help move forward but it's going to help you replace the bad habits and replace the things that you were doing wrong so if you're used to even just talking really negatively to yourself it's going to be really hard to just walk around all day with a blank mind but if you can replace the negativity with affirmations and with positive and self-love and positive talk, then you're, you're like, you're killing two birds with one stone because you're, you're stopping, you're stopping the negative habit and you're building a new good habit. And it becomes really easy to do when you experience that shift in your body, because if your nervous system noticed that, oh, you hum for a few minutes and you feel so relaxed and quiet and calm, it's going to send the signal that it wants more of that. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this feels good. Give me more. And it gets easier and easier to do again and again because you naturally start to crave it. Not from a place of like gripping and addiction, but in a place of like, this is something that I, that supports me in a way that feels so good that I want to do it over whatever other thing you're, you're doing. And that will take priority all of a sudden. It definitely happens. Like the more good things you do, the more good things you want to do. It's just sort of a way. That's how you build momentum. But it's like the, the humming is a part I've made it a part of my morning routine. Most days 
I do like some humming and like beating my chest and like after my meditation and getting that vibration, it just feels good. It's a great like reset to start the day with like yeah. some and some something like beating your chest when you're hitting the rib cage area, right? Like there's different <laughs> kriyas in yoga where you like you hit your arms against your ribs this way, right? So hitting the rib cage or like pressure around the neck. There's the vagus nerve that comes in here. So you're like activating a relaxation response from the friction or the pounding that you create. And that's just another tool. It's not random that hitting your chest is exactly. good. There's like a scientific nervous system based explanation behind it, which right. is, I'm kind of nerdy, but it's very exciting, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we love that. A lot of this conversation kind of also goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning about the, uh, the autonomous nervous system, where you, you do have you can play with it a little bit and take control because you can control your inner state and your response to an extent. Like there's obviously going to be some things that are too quick for you, but being aware that you're doing it can give you the opportunity to slow down and take control. And it's like everything, everything in life is two way streets. Mm -hmm. And if you're stressed, you're going to have uh, mentally stressed. You're going to have a physical response to that. In the same way that if you're, if you're fine and you're not stressed, but you're, you're moving your body in a way that's going to elicit stress, you're going to trigger to your brain that you're under stress and you can do the same thing slowing down. So like a lot of it, like poor breathing mechanics is a great example, will put people into a stressful anxiety kind of mindset, but really good breathing mechanics and slowing down is a really good way to bridge that gap between the mental and physical totally totally as simple as like a fear-based thought will create stress in your body because if we think of the the sympathetic response your muscles are going to tense your breath is going to change your heartbeat your blood pressure all of these things can cascade off one simple thought or a thought that you tend to repeat probably because 85 percent of our thoughts are repetitive right so like if you have one fear-based thought you probably think that kind of thought very often so from the brain to the body, it happens this way, as you were mentioning. And then from the other way, whether it's your breath pattern, your postural pattern, or you like collapse in, in a position of protection, that uh -huh. sends a message to your brain, right? Are you in the position of like, I'm so tense all the time because I'm working at the computer and like my neck, I can't, that sends a message to your brain, even if you're not actually stressed about what you're working about, right? Like there's, it goes both ways and the breath mm. is is as you say, kind of that bridge, but a very interesting tool to manage both ends, if that makes sense. Like you can use the breath to like, if you quiet your breath, you'll, you'll notice, chances are that your mind quiets down. On the other side, if you quiet your breath, you'll notice that your body relaxes. So like you can go back and forth and the breath is this one thing that is not solely automatic. Like, thank God it is automatic and we don't have to think of the 20,000 breaths we take every day. But we can also like make a choice and be like, I'm going to control the breath. And because we have that capacity, then it ripples into the mind that we don't have as much kind of grasp and grip over controlling <laughs> and the body also. Like there's so many auto auto autonomic and automatic things happening that sometimes, like we talked about for the nervous system, it's hard to control. So the breath gives us that power to affect the different systems around. Yeah, I love that. That's that's so true. Yeah, the breath is so powerful. Just being able to get through all the organs and relieving the stress. And yeah, that's amazing. Well, I want to, because, oh my gosh, we could. I feel like we could talk for hours. I agree. <laughs> you are so, oh my gosh, you're so intelligent. You break everything down. Like you said, you love the scientific, but you're, you're putting it, like we, like we said, I know exactly what you're talking about. You're, you're, you're saying it so eloquently. But I do want to dive deep into yoga before we let you go, because you are so, you're this amazing yoga teacher and practitioner. And I want to just get a better sense of what yoga is and how it plays a really significant role in the reduction of stress and how it aids in overall wellness. What yoga is, is like a really big question. So I'm going to put the philosophy thing aside yeah, yeah. And, like <laughs> we won't talk about that but in that context of like stress reduction and nervous system I think yoga is just one incredible somatic tool to affect your system it's a way to move the energy through the body yeah. and yoga includes so many things right it's not only the physical posture 
but it's a breath practice. And we just talked about that. If at the minimum, it's just matching your movement with your breath and bringing some awareness there, that's great. If it's a type of control of slowing down or of, of moving faster, of changing the, um, the length of one side versus the other, of using retentions, like there's so many tools within yoga that use the breath. And we, we've already mentioned how powerful that could be. So there's that. There's just the part of the practice that is about mindfulness, that is about presence, that is about awareness, that is about self-study. That is all part of yoga. If you do look into the philosophy aspect of it, self-study is a huge part of it. It's like one of those main, you know, big pillars of what yoga practice is. I would also like, you can control the intensity of the movement. We talked a little bit about, you know, moving dynamically with like a certain pace to meet yourself in agitation or slowing down, inverting. So you can have, there's a very strong energetic component to different poses and what they can bring. So you can very elegantly create movements that serve your nervous system for what you need in that moment by choosing what the, the type of poses you're going to use, the speed at which you're going to do them, whether you're going to use more um, like just pay, like slow paced even or a variation with like some explosive movements, that's going to make a difference, right? So there's there's so many things you can play with within the shapes themselves and how you transition from one to the other. And then there's the whole energetic side of the practice, whether you bring in kriyas, vibration, mantras, chanting, uh, mudras, all of those things are more subtle, but they are part of affecting your nervous system. For me and why I was called to yoga, and it's funny because it brings us like to that first question, yoga was a tool of liberation. Mm. like in a, in a nutshell and I think I still see it like that today and it's still how I teach it it's a way to understand yourself and meet yourself and give yourself what you need funny how it kind of sounds similar to something else we talked about um, <laughs> from this place of loving acceptance you know and like self-care self-love place so that is yoga for me in a embodied way it's the same it's the same thing it's just through your body and with your energy in the system that's been in place for thousands of years and that was you know figured out without the whole science science mm -hmm. thing kinds of things which the mist you know the mysteriousness of it makes me very curious and there is yeah and I actually love what you just said it I just had a kind of like a light bulb moment because in all honesty, when I began my, I'd say like fitness journey, when I was like trying to lose a bunch of weight in, in the height of my, uh, eating disorder, mm -hmm. I would say to Dan all the time, like, I just wanted to go hard. I, I wanted to basically punish myself into looking a certain way and going to the gym and doing tons of cardio and lifting weights. And I never ever had an interest in yoga because I thought it was just like boring and like how would that you know be good for me then as years passed and I you know continued the health journey and I really started paying attention to the more in-depth aspects of myself and eating better and being mindful and I introduced just like yoga practices that I I found on the tv at the time and would do them and I was like this is the most therapeutic way for me to channel my mental strength and holding the positions, which are very challenging, but it gave me a chance to understand my body's physical capabilities, as well as the mental capabilities and the strength that I had built up over the couple of years. And it's like, when I tell you it's the most beautiful thing, I, I love doing it now. <laughs> And I just, it goes to show that I really, I wasn't in a place at that time when I was, I had really low self-worth and I, I didn't want to listen to my internal talk. And I just kind of like, Fair. I started distracting myself in the gym and now I can't, I can't get enough of it. It's, it's beautiful. So I, so I love that. And I just want to say, thank you so much for being incredibly vulnerable because a lot of people don't, don't do that. And especially, you know, hide it. And, you know, especially on social media or any type of platform where you're speaking to people, you kind of go in with your, you know, full truth and, you know, painting the best picture, but 
to really understand and to help people to dig down into the root causes of, of what you've gone through and what you've been through. It's just, it's so beautiful to listen to. I want I want to thank you for that. It's taken me a long time to figure my vulnerability, but I, I love hearing it. it. It's helping me on my journey too. So I, I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Well, Erica, is there any parting words before, before we, before we let you go? We certainly want to um, just give you the chance to, if there's, you know, the social media aspect, if you want us to put anything in the show notes where people can find you, obviously where they can listen to your podcast, because we can't recommend that enough. <laughs> um, gosh, I love the episodes that, that you do. And you kind of talk about anything and everything in your podcast too, which, which we very much appreciate, you know? Yeah, the podcast is about yoga on and off the mat, which is basically your whole life, you know, yogic lifestyle and yoga and everything that that includes. And for me, that's a lot of personal development because I talked about how it's a tool for liberation and it's a tool, you know, to manage yourself in your life in that, in that way. So yeah, if people want to dig deeper into the nervous system and into the stress, I have a full episode just on stress, a full episode on nervous system 101 and one on all the tools, like Great. 40 minutes on all the tools that you can use for your nervous system. So they can go nerd out on these and I can send you the links for that for the show notes. Yeah. If they want to connect with me, in the show notes. If they want to connect with me, um, the website is the best place to to do that. So ericabelanger.com. and from there they can take um, a quiz to like find out what type of self care they need. I have guided meditations they can download. I have all sorts of tools for them to to explore and you know, just come say hi on Instagram at Erica Belanger or on and off your mat podcast, either, either way. So I'm on there every day. So that's probably the quickest way if they just want to like send a DM and be like, I have a question or I, I, I need to work with you in some way, then yeah. Instagram is always a great place to go. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's great. You, you are a wealth of knowledge and you have so many resources. So we can't wait thank to you. link all these in the show notes. And again, we thank you so much for joining us on this Such episode. A pleasure. Sure. Such a pleasure. I'm actually going to add one more thing that I just forgot. And it's so incredible. I just yeah. announced last week um, that we are opening a new retreat and we're going to do a yoga retreat based on stress and nervous system. So it's going to be exploring all of those things, how they work in your body. So seven days on the beach at working on elevating your baseline, opening your window of tolerance and getting to know yourself in that way. So you can serve and <sighs> feel your best That's amazing. Will it be in Mexico? it's in mexico okay You're yeah amazing. luxury hotel boutique we're by ourselves on the side of the ocean on the beach and this beautiful beautiful place where it's super like everything is around the environment they have their own permaculture farm they do all solar energy like it's just a beautiful energetic place and we'll do all the practices for the system and then we're exploring things of the land like cacao ceremonies and Tamascal sweat lodge ceremonies and all these things. So it's very, very powerful week for people if they want to really immerse themselves into these practices and do it with like-minded people as well. Absolutely. Well, that's super exciting. We'll also link that in show notes. Amazing, Erica. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Such a pleasure.